moms and missions. Now, if there is anyone who lives their life with a mission in mind, or they are on mission, it is moms. That's how my mom was growing up. She was always focused, always had a mission in mind. And so it feels like these are two good things to combine together. And so we'll get to that uh, in just a little bit further. But the thing about my mom is not only was she always someone who had a mission in mind, my mom was a great gift giver. Anyone who has a mom, it's just a really good gift giver. My mom is awesome at giving gifts. Um, she's always been good at it. She'll make them or buy them or whatever. And it was always usually impressive or funny. Uh, and this was a trend that continued after I moved out of the house when I was 21. And um, she actually had to step it up even more once I moved out of the house. Because now it wasn't like she could just make something and keep it there. Now she had to send something to me. And so let me show you a few examples of my mom's creativity on display. Uh, my favorite kind of cake, because I love cake, is ice cream cake. And more than that, it is Baskin Robbins pralines and cream ice cream cake. We're going to get specific. But I don't know if you know this, you can't ship an ice cream cake in the mail, at least not in the South. Maybe you could get away with that here, like seven months out of the year when it's winter. Can't do that in Texas. And so uh, what she did is she decided to go with my favorite candy instead. And so I have a picture right here. Uh, this was many years ago for my 22nd birthday. She created a Reese's cake and layered it and made it look all nice with the candles and everything. And she made it and then sent it in the mail to where I received it and I enjoyed it. I can't remember whether I shared it or not, but I was before I was married, so it doesn't matter. Um, here's a, another example of her creativity on display. Um, so for, for some context, my mom always gives us ornaments every year uh, that symbolizes something big. And so back in 2019, Kara and I moved to Florida. Um, and it was also the same year that I got my first tattoo, which is right here. And so my mom gave me a Florida gator. And if you look closely, you can see that she drew and taped my tattoo onto the alligator's arm <laughs> on the inside of it. Because again, that is what she does. She makes these creative things and then she sends them my way. Uh, one more example. Uh, we moved here and uh, again, like I said, not from this area, and so I needed to get new tires on the car. Uh, and it was coming up to, or, or Christmas wasn't too far after that, and so my mom had given me some money to get new tires, some all-season tires, so that people didn't know that I wasn't from here when I was driving and skidding around, you know? And so she sent me the money, and then she sent me this, which is a cardboard tire that she cut out, painted, and then used some sort of Elmer's glue or toaster strudel icing and wrote Michelin, and that is a Michelin man uh, next to that, if you can't see that. And she put snow tire on there. And so uh, I am 31 years old, and I still receive crafts from my mother in the mail. And I'm okay with that, all right? I'm okay with that. But she was always creative at, at making gifts, and um, she got even more creative when she had to send Gifts, And I use those words intentionally because when we think about the church, um, the church is called to make disciples. Most of us have heard that before. Maybe we know that. We'll unpack that a little bit. But there's another part of that that we miss sometimes. And that's that not only are we to make disciples, we want to send disciples as well. We want to make disciples here and then we want to send disciples people out to go and take the message of the gospel elsewhere. And the truth of the matter, if I can just get a little crazy here, which again, some of my, my crazy dream uh, or my crazy dreamer mentality came from my mom uh, because she was always thinking about others. Um, she always had multiple kids that she was supporting in multiple countries and um, all of those different things. And so I get a little bit of that from her. But if we can be crazy for a second, what I would love to see in the future is I would love to see Rhythm be a sending church, meaning not only 
Would I love to see rhythm grow and become healthier and all those sorts of things? One day, I would love for rhythm to send missionaries out to other countries, other places around this country. I'd love to see rhythm plant churches one day. I'd love to see rhythm be a place that can train up pastors, that can send them out to go and take over churches that need help. I would love that kind of thing to happen. And I know some of you have been here for a while and you're like, you're insane. Let's try to meet the monthly budget first. But the truth is, this is the vision that drives the rest of it, right? Because I would love to see us be a church that is making disciples and we are sending disciples, that we are a church that has a mission in mind. Now, I'm going to introduce you to a missionary that we support here in just a little bit. But before we do that, let's unpack what this means a little bit. So if you have a Bible, go and open up to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28. We're going to look at verses 16 through 20. This is a passage that you may be familiar with, especially if you grew up in church, typically called the Great Commission. And so I'm going to read this for us, and then we're going to unpack that a little bit. All right. So I'll have it up here on the screen. If you don't have a Bible, no worries. Um, if you see a phrase that is highlighted, I want you guys to say that with me. And listen, I know it's gloomy outside, all right? I know you wanted to sleep in, but I got to get some help up here, okay? So, it says, the 11 disciples traveled to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. When they saw Jesus, they worshiped, but some doubted. Jesus came near and said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and what? Make disciples. Make disciples of all nations. all nations. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. So these were Jesus' last words before he ascended back into heaven. And I would imagine that Jesus chose his last words very carefully. And so in his last moment, when he had one more thing that he could tell his disciples, he said, I am calling you to go and make more disciples of all nations. That was Jesus' big word to them. Now, again, if you've grown up in church, you've probably heard the word disciple thrown around. You've maybe heard the phrase make disciples. You've probably heard the term discipleship. But the thing is, is when we throw these things out all the time, it gets really muddy as to what we're actually talking about. Right? Well, what are we actually getting at when we say discipleship, when we say disciples? So let's cut away the fat. Let's get to the, the meat of it. Here is what a disciple is. A disciple is someone who is following Christ and being transformed by Christ. Following Christ, being transformed by Christ, which may seem like too simple of a definition, but that's what the Bible tells us. In fact, because of some of the confusion surrounding this word, some people have started to take the word disciple and, and they've changed it to the word apprentice because it gives that idea of apprenticing under someone. We are apprenticing under Jesus, learning his word and his ways and following him. So that's what a disciple is. And so if we put that together, then that means the discipleship or making disciples is the process of helping others follow Christ so they can be transformed by Christ. Which is really good news because when you realize that that's what discipleship is, you understand that it's not as complicated as we sometimes make it out to be. It's not as complicated or, or scary as we make it out to be. See, contrary to the images that may come to mind when we talk about this subject, discipleship doesn't necessarily happen in a class. It can happen over coffee. Discipleship doesn't just happen through sermons. It can happen through small groups and Bible studies. Discipleship doesn't happen through tests and quizzes and those sorts of things, but through 
relationships and conversations. And so what we see is that maybe making disciples isn't quite as intimidating as we first thought. See, my mom, my mom was good at this. My mom was really good at this. I, I had a lot of friends growing up um, that were not Christians. My older brother had a lot of friends that were not Christians. And, and the funny thing is, is even though my mom was and, and was outspoken about it, our friends were always willing to talk to my mom because she was just good at having a posture that invited people into conversation, invited people into relationship. And if I said, Mom, you're, you're doing part of what it means to make disciples, she probably would have been like, no, I'm not. I'm just having conversations. But she may have not tied those together because she had some tough conversations with people. When some of our friends were hurting, my mom would jump in there and bring encouragement or comfort. When they weren't sure what to do, she'd bring advice. And so she was doing that hard work, even if she didn't necessarily call it that at the time. And so for all of us, if we know Christ, we are a disciple. If we know Christ, then our call is to go and make disciples. Now, the question is, well, who does God want to involve in this plan? Well, let's look back. Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. What nations? All nations. All of them. Not just here, not just there. God calls us to go out and reach the nations with the good news of the gospel. In fact, this word, nations in the Greek, um, is the word ethnos, which is where we get our English word ethnicity. And so what Jesus is saying is go and make followers of Jesus, disciples, apprentices of Jesus, of all nations, all people groups, of all different kinds, because that is the beauty of the kingdom. Revelation shows us in the end, and I believe it's in chapter 7, where they're surrounding the throne, and there's a multitude of, of nations, different tribes, tongues, languages, worshiping God together. And the way that's going to happen is through the Great Commission. And so Jesus is telling us what to do, and then he's telling us who he wants to involve in that process. And so now we have to figure out what does he mean when he says go? Go where? Well, I think to make disciples of all nations, we must cross the street and cross the ocean. Cross the street, cross the ocean. Some of us, myself included, need to take a stroll across the street, down the street, down the alley, and meet those neighbors that we kind of shyly wave at and then move on with our lives. And then some of us, God may be calling us to cross an ocean, to go on a short-term mission trip somewhere, maybe like the person I'm going to bring up, to go and be a long-term missionary somewhere. I don't know exactly what that looks like for each person, but as a church, we want to do both of those things. And anybody can be involved. You don't have to be a super Christian to do that. Anybody can be involved in that process because we are all disciples. So the reality is, is if people are going to hear, then we need to go. If people are going to hear, then we need to send. And that's what we want to be as a church, we want to be a church that is a disciple-making church and a disciple-sending church. And that takes time. That's a process. But it's part of our heart. And again, in a moment, I'm going to introduce you to one of the missionaries that we actually support as a church, whether you know it or not. And then we also support a few other people as well, and people that are a part of Youth for Christ um, also, the boatmans who, Caitlin, you saw sing up here earlier, their plan is to go to South Africa, hopefully next year, to be camp directors there. And so it is going to be a sad, sad day when they leave, but it is going to be a beautiful day for the kingdom and the gospel because we get to send people out to make more disciples. 
And so that's what we want to do as a church, and that's what we want to be a part of because the gospel was never meant to stay with us. It was always meant to go through us to others. So with that said, I'm going to invite Aslan up to come and talk with us for a little bit. Why don't you guys give it up for Aslan? That would be great. Thank you, Bob. And I'll move this over, and we can just kind of sit down and make it a nice little fun chat. All right. And Bob's going to grab you your mic over there as well. Uh, why don't we switch spots so I can make sure I'm asking you the right questions, or I'll just make them up. Um, so this is Aslan. Uh, I tried to get Megan to play Africa by Toto when you came up, but she wouldn't do it. So sorry, guys. We missed out on some low-hanging fruit there. Um, so we want to get to know you as a church. Um, and it's always kind of weird when you're just like, hey, why don't you tell us your name, where you're from, you know. So we're going to do two truths and a lie, okay? So two truths and a lie. Uh, if you don't know what that is, uh, just think about what it's called. <laughs> two truths and a lie. So we're going to tell you three pieces of information. And then from there, you have to decide which one you think is a lie. And this is pertaining to Aslan and her time on the mission field, all right? Do we have those on the screen, Megan? Sweet. Okay. So, two truths and a lie. First piece of information is that Aslan has served in Togo, Africa, for five years. Second piece of information is that Aslan speaks three languages. And the third is that Aslan works with the blind population in Togo. So, if you think that the first one, letter A, is the lie, go ahead and raise your hand. Mm. People don't believe that you've been there very long. <laughs> hmm. Messed up. If you think the lie is B, raise your hand. Mm. Okay. Now they're like, she hasn't been there long. She doesn't speak these languages. She's a liar. <laughs> uh, third one, C. If you think C is the lie, raise your hand. Okay, Aslan, would you like to tell us which are the truths and which are the lies? Yes, I would. Oh, let's see. Just wanted to add a little suspense for you there. Yep. Um, actually, C is, was the lie. I do not work with the blind population. I work with the deaf population in Togo. It's so. a trick question. It was a trick question. Nice. So you've been there five years then. Yes. What languages do you speak? Uh, English, obviously, French, and Togolese sign language. Whoa, that's cool. Yeah. That's very, are you like fluent in them? As fluent as I can get, yeah. I'm still fluent. learning stuff every day, but yeah, nice. pretty much. Well, that's awesome. Um, well, so you're a missionary in Togo, Africa. Um, why don't you tell us how God called you into that? What, how did God call you to cross the ocean and to make this your life? Yeah, for sure. So um, my, so my mom worked with people with disabilities for most of my life growing up. And so I've always had a little bit of a draw toward the, the marginalized people, the people that most people overlook. And that's always been something that's in my heart. And um, so I started asking God once I graduated, what do you want me to do with this, uh, this heart that you've given me? And I had, uh, I, I believe that God was leading me to go to grad school, to be a social worker in, um, in a place like Chicago or a city or something like that. Um, and so I, I went on a trip to Zambia after I graduated from college, and God just opened up my eyes to the reality of the world um, for the marginalized and the way that they're treated in the majority world. And my heart was absolutely broken, um, even more so for the marginalized than it was before seeing uh, the way that, it, that they were treated. And so I started asking God, where do you want to send me? I, I'll go wherever you want me to go. And um, so got me... Uh, connected with a mission organization called Converge, and through a bunch of different avenues, um, was led to Togo, and so that's where I am today. Hmm. That's awesome. I love that. Um, so I'm going to skip over one question, and then we're going to bounce back. Um, so there are a lot of places that you can go in the world, um, a lot of different people groups, a lot of unreached people groups, underreached people groups. Um, why Togo? What's the, what are the unique challenges and opportunities in going to Togo? Yeah, Togo is, um, it's a really interesting place. So it's actually the birthplace of voodoo, um, Togo and in the neighboring country of Benin. And so it's an extremely, extremely dark spiritual place. 
Um, so that presents a lot of challenges. There's, I mean, you can you can palpably feel the darkness when you step in, you know into the country, and uh, but honestly, that creates a lot of unique opportunities as well. Everybody has um, a spiritual mindset. Everything has a spiritual component, and so it's very easy to start up a spiritual conversation with people, whether you're talking to the local witch doctor or you're just talking to somebody in the village. It's pretty easy to bring up spiritual conversations because they believe that everything has a spiritual component. And so um, specifically when it comes to the deaf, there's upwards of 80,000 deaf people in a in really small country, makes up 1% of the population. So there's a lot of opportunity, there's a lot of challenge again that goes with that. Finding them, first of all, is, is a bit of a challenge. They're hiding in plain sight. Um, but we know that they're there. And so uh, once you ask somebody in a village, do you know any deaf people? almost always you'll be able to find somebody. And so there's a lot of, the challenges become the opportunities as well mm. over there. That's cool. I did not know that that was the birthplace of voodoo. Mm -hmm. Wow, that does make for a unique darkness and a unique chance for light to be a part of that. That's very cool. Um, so in my experience, when we think of missionaries, a lot of us think of these sort of like superhumans, you know, where you go and you, you live in a hut and you spend your time um, healing, illnesses by laying your hands on people and casting out demons and wrestling lions and those sorts of things. And if that is what you do, then awesome. But uh, most of the time we have this sort of bigger than life picture. And so what does day to day life, week to week life look like for you in Togo? Yeah, it, that question is hard for me to answer because every day looks different. Um, but it looks like a lot like your guys' life. I mean, I go to work, uh, it just, just looks a little bit different. But so for, for me in particular, um, a typical day could look like having a sign language class with my, with my sign language teacher. Um, we, he used to teach me sign language, now we kind of do discipleship together, which has been really fun. So he's deaf, so he's one of the disciples that I've been able to make. Uh, sometimes it looks like going to the local deaf school and teaching a Bible lesson at the deaf school with my sign language teacher. Uh, sometimes it looks like going and meeting a new deaf child that, that came across our path um, and meeting their family, asking them questions, figuring out what might be a next step for this deaf child so they, they could have access to education and language and things like that. Um, but sometimes it just looks like hanging out with our team and building building up our team. We have 11 people um, on our team, and so just sometimes it just looks like hanging out with them and building that relationship or, um, or going to church on a Sunday uh, like you guys. So it kind of... It varies um, day to day, but nothing usually super duper spectacular, just kind of taking steps of obedience wherever God calls me every day. Hmm. That's cool, because it's not, it's not like so different from our context, where you're over there, you know, doing these crazy things, and we're back here going, well, how do we, how do we make disciples here? That's so lame here. But it's definitely not. It's, it's the same Holy Spirit that's working. It's the same um, spiritual issues that we deal with, and, but you're in a different context, um, which is very cool. So, um, what would you say to someone who might be feeling called to either go on a short-term mission trip or cross the ocean and make uh, being a missionary their vocation in another country? Um, I, I would say take the next step that's in front of you. I think it can be kind of an overwhelming thing. If you've never been on a short-term mission trip, if you've never uh, you've considered being a missionary, it may seem like it's this huge thing that, oh man, I have to sell all my belongings and move right away. It's Listen to God and, and ask him, what is the next step that I need to take? And a lot of times that's just even asking a question or uh, just attending a meeting, you know, something like that. Just take the next step. Don't worry about all the steps that are in front of you. Just take the one that's right in front of you. Hmm. That's a good word. Um, as we wrap up, what are ways that we as a church body can support you in what you are doing? Um, usually when people ask me like next steps that you guys can take, uh, we have three next steps that we, that we normally suggest and that's give, pray, and go. Um, you guys here at Rhythm have been supporting me actually before I even hit the mission field. So probably about six years that you guys have been partners with me. So thank you for that. Um, and we, we really greatly appreciate that. Please be praying with us. Um, as I said, we're, I mean, we're living in a pretty spiritually dark place. We desperately need your prayers and we feel those. Um, as you guys are joining us in prayers, in prayer. And one of the things that you can pray for is that more people would choose to go um, and come join us over in Togo. We know that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. We have so much work. God is doing so much over there, 
more than we can keep up with ourselves. We know that we need more people to come, whether that looks like um, short, a short-term trip, like, like you had said, or uh, for a couple weeks, or an internship for our younger people here. If you're a senior or older, um, we would gladly have you for a six week long internship in the summer. Uh, we also offer two year residency programs right now um, or you know, long term missions as well. And so give, pray, and go. Those are the ways that I think you guys can come along and, and support. Sweet, that is awesome. Well, thank you so much um, for being here. Thank you for what you're doing. Um, God willing, we will be in Togo next year with you, um, a handful of us from the church, and um, we'll get to see up close what God is doing there. So thanks for all you do. You guys give it up for Aslan. You just hold that down, and it'll turn off. <laughs> awesome. Well, um, if you are interested in more of that, if you're interested in some information, um, you want to talk to Aslan more, you want to ask her some questions, um, you want to hear some cool stories, uh, whatever that looks like, you are welcome to hang out at the Next Steps desk after service. She'll be over there. She's got some different materials um, that she can get you. And then we'll also have some cookies and lemonade out there as well. And so again, go hang out, ask questions, um, figure out what that may look like for you. Because again, I'm, I'm praying that God continues to use rhythm and that we continue to make disciples and that we will be a church that sends disciples. Well, uh, as we close the service and head into a couple more worship songs and our, our time of communion, I want to sort of focus us on something, and that is the fact that our ability to make disciples, our ability to go, whether it's across the street, across the ocean, um, is only possible because of what Jesus has done. Um, that is the foundation for what we get to do. And so Jesus has loved us. He has pursued us. He did not just cross the street or the ocean. He crossed from heaven to earth to live amongst us, um, where he was, lived a perfect life. He was crucified for our sins to pay the penalty of our sins. And he rose again, proving that everything he said was true and that he is the Messiah that we have been waiting for. And so let's focus our minds on that as we worship today, because that is what this is all about. Um, that is what is the fuel for missions, and that is also something that can serve as a fuel for moms, moms that are maybe exhausted, moms that are dealing, again, with the ups and downs of life, um, remembering Jesus, who he is, what he's done, and that he sees you, um, and that can be our fuel for moving forward. So let me pray for us, and then we will respond together. God, we thank you, God, for what you're doing. Lord, I... I can't imagine just getting a 10,000 foot view of our world and God seeing all the ways that you are moving here, all the ways that you're moving in this country and, and all across this globe. Um, God, that your spirit is at work in such powerful ways everywhere. And God, we thank you that we get to be a part of that. God, thank you that, that we get to be a part of reaching dark places. Um, God, that we get to be a part of reaching unreached people groups, underreached people groups. God, I thank you that right here, God, we have so many opportunities to share the gospel, to bring a newer believer under our wings and walk them through what it means to follow Jesus. We just thank you for those opportunities, God. I pray that you would expand our hearts, God, enlarge our hearts to have compassion for those around us and for those that are not near us but across the ocean. And God, I thank you again for the moms here, God, that live their lives on mission. God, always looking ahead to what is next. God, I pray that you would give them grace. God, that you would give them endurance. God, and I pray that for those that are, are struggling, uh, maybe because of loss or unfulfilled dreams or desires, God, would you minister to them by your grace, by your kindness, by your love. God, we thank you that, that you see us, God, that you know what we are walking through and that you care deeply. God, I pray that your spirit would fill us with hope and joy and all of the fruit of the spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.